grace and peace to you in abundance from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. So, friends, here we are. It's the week after Easter. The good news is the stone is still rolled away. The tomb is still empty. But in some ways, maybe it feels like those first disciples of Jesus feel the week after Easter, all sort of huddled together in our homes. I, I'm truly delighted and, and excited that, that we can still be able to gather online and share invitations with people all around the world, but this, this is just hard to get used to, isn't it? I miss you all. It's not quite the same not being able to be together in person, I feel a little bit like I've, I've been exiled away from being with all of you together. It feels so far from normal, and, and this is kind of the way life is in a hundred other ways, too, right now, isn't it? And so maybe that's what makes this the perfect time to begin this new message series where we're going to be studying through the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. A book of the Bible that we're going to find is extremely helpful and relevant to dealing with such a time as this, when things don't feel normal. You see, Daniel and his friends were having to deal with a time in life that didn't feel anything like normal to them. It wasn't anything they'd been used to. They were now exiles, separated from everything that felt familiar they were just teenagers when they were taken off into captivity to live in a foreign country a long ways away from home. This isn't anything that Daniel and his friends signed up for. This isn't what they wanted, like what a teenager would. But rather, he was thrust into it. His whole life was turned upside down. His entire world changed abruptly. And so it is. For many of us today, even though you know, we're all at different places, different seasons of life, no matter what age we are, we're dealing with this feeling of a new normal. Life is different right now for people all around the world, but it's also different in a special way, in the big picture of things, for us who call ourselves Christians, because we know that this is not our permanent home. Th this world, as good as it is, and even at its best, is not our true, lasting home. We, we live in a, a place, we live in a world where a tiny little virus can bring mighty nations and economies down to their knees. And this country even, as great as it is, this place is not our true and permanent home. This is not the enduring for all time kingdom of God. And more and more we're being reminded of this in all kinds of different ways. We no longer live in, in a country where Christianity is the prevailing world view. More and more we find ourselves living in a, a post-Christian culture, they're calling it where we daily encounter values and beliefs that are directly or subtly opposed to Christ and his, world, and his word. It's not the majority of people anymore who, who know what's actually in the Bible beyond a few memes or a couple of little verses, perhaps. Most people, the majority, don't really know what's in the Bible because they didn't grow up with it in their home or in church or in school. And so we, we see our young people absorbing the messages that they get from the secular world around them in social media and in movies and in the, the content that they consume on YouTube and so forth. We ourselves, we, we see our friends, our, our loved ones sharing things online that sometimes lacks Christian discernment. And if we're honest... We ourselves, all of us, are far more influenced by the culture in which we live 
than we're probably even aware. And now in the, the middle of a global pandemic, we've left behind so many familiar feeling things and we're left wondering, well, what, what is the future going to hold? So how do we navigate this new normal? Can we do it? Or will our faith crumble through it? Well, well the good news is, friends, that Today we're going to begin to find tremendous comfort and direction in the book of Daniel over the next couple of weeks. The book of Daniel throughout history has proved to be really comforting to God's people in dark times. We're going to see how God still remains at work in control of the world. How it still remains possible to live a life faithful to Jesus and his word even in a world that opposes it. And how God wants to give us strength to patiently and faithfully live for him, even when it means carrying our crosses. So what do we do to navigate life when things feel far from normal? Well, let's get to know Daniel as we start to explore uh, this book of the Bible with Daniel and his friends taking a look at that question. What do we do to navigate life when things feel far from normal? We'll begin in Daniel chapter 1, and we'll start off with the first couple verses. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah... Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. So here's what happened. This is some of the essential context to understanding the whole book of Daniel. We were introduced to this guy, Nebuchadnezzar.
well informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that they were to enter the king's service. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, the name Belteshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach. And to Azariah, Abednego. <laughs> so one of the interesting things that we find out here that Daniel and his friends were from the royal family. That's interesting because recall that it was through the royal line of the kings of Judah that God had made a promise that one day the Savior of the world was going to come. So this is a big deal. But now, all of God's promises were, were seemingly in jeopardy. If Daniel and his friends don't make it out of this, then, then all is lost. In the same way, we might... Think about on Good Friday when Jesus is then buried. If, if he doesn't come out of that tomb alive on Easter, then all our hope is lost. And it would take nothing less than divine providence to fulfill God's promise in a situation like this. At the same time, think about this, that these young men, this, this next generation was carried off into captivity while their parents and grandparents were left home completely bereaved. Can you imagine their pain, their sense of loss? Right now, for many of us, it's kind of hard to wrap our minds around the thoughts and feelings of the fact that the class of 2020 graduating from high school this year isn't going to be able to experience all of the, the normal senior year and graduation type things. It's hard to fathom a little bit living at a time when everything that seems familiar in life or if you're in high school and your high school experience has now been kind of abruptly taken away. There was a, a trending article on CNN this week about how traumatized high school seniors feel right now. They interviewed Miami area high school seniors who, who said comment after comment that it feels like all of their dreams have been snatched away from them. Can you imagine what it would feel like if our entire 2020 graduating class from Divine Savior Academy was forcibly taken off into captivity, given names associated with foreign gods and idols, our whole campus leveled to the ground, knowing that we would never see any of them ever again, and that they were going to be indoctrinated into the, the worldview and beliefs of a completely hostile religion to the one true God at the, at the University of Babylon. Can you imagine the sense of pain and loss? What hope would we or they have that we could ever get through something like that? Certainly it would take more than a government stimulus check to lift us up and to give us hope. Would we be forced to conclude that all God's promises have failed? Would we have a sense of falling away from the very goodness of our God? Or might yet something else happen? Something miraculous even that could rekindle our hope and give us joy even when things seem so far from normal. Let's continue on in Daniel's story. Verse 8 it says, But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, 
and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Now, God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel, but the official told Daniel, I am afraid of my lord the king, who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please test your servants for ten days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for ten days. At the end of the ten days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice of food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. So there's something incredible starting to happen here. Do you see it? It, it was sad that these young men were so far away from home. But God was going to make it into a blessing for many that they were, in a sense, sent out now to shine the light of their faith into this dark and hostile world. Daniel and his friends from the very beginning were being groomed for political leadership in Babylon. So Nebuchadnezzar's plan was to just completely turn them into to Babylonians. He wanted them to, to think like Babylonians. He wanted to educate them like Babylonians, speak like the Babylonians, worship like the Babylonians. So he gave them blasphemous Babylonian names. All the opposite things about how a Jewish person was supposed to live in an authentic way to honor God. Right? But instead of becoming Babylonian, what happened? Daniel and his friends found a way to remain faithful to God even when things felt far, far from normal. It wasn't easy. They were given these blasphemous Babylonian names. I mean, what could they do about that, right? Daniel, the name Daniel means God is my judge, the Lord. But Nebuchadnezzar says, nope, your name now is Belteshazzar, which means something like Bel or Marduk is your protector now. Okay? Bel or Marduk, that was the name of the chief Babylonian god. All right, so when Nebuchadnezzar took all the, the worship items from the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem and he brought them back to the temple of his god, he's taken them and said, okay, Marduk, these are yours now. And so this is kind of a way for Nebuchadnezzar to say to Daniel, all right, Daniel, you know what? The Lord, he ain't your God anymore. Because you're, you're in Babylonia now, son. Marduk is the most high. Your God, he's forgotten you. But Daniel wasn't buying it. He wasn't going to bite. He's kind of like, you know, you can call me whatever you want. But you can't define me. You don't get to tell me who I am. You can try and tell me what, what, what I should do. But you can't force me to worship your false god idol. You can change my name. But you can't change what I believe right here. No matter where I live or what you say or how I feel, I know to whom I belong, the Lord God Most High. I'd prefer to be back home right now, but I'm going to bloom right here where my God has planted me. So friends, how about you? Where has God planted you so that your faith and your influence for Jesus and his kingdom might bloom, even when it feels like you're far, far away from normal. 
That's what this whole thing about the royal food is all about. Maybe you're wondering about that a little bit, right? Like, not only did God's law in the Old Testament forbid Jews from eating certain foods, but they were also forbidden from eating foods that had been sacrificed in an idol temple worship service. And so probably what was going on here is that, that like, in a lot of pagan cultures, right, they would have these animal sacrifices at the, at the pagan temple, like, like where Marduk is worshipped, and then they would, they would sell the leftovers at the marketplace, or in this case, they, they might provide it as food for others. And these libations of wine were poured out in worship of these false gods. But Daniel didn't want to compromise his personal integrity. He, he had to live in this strange, new kind of normal. There was no game plan for doing this, but this was a way for him, according to his conscience, to try and live a God-honoring, faithful life, even when he seemed far away. So tactfully, he goes to the guard and reasons with him. And God, God takes care of him. In fact, even here in Babylon, where things seemed far from normal, God was still very much at work. I don't know if you caught the little comment offhand, but important all throughout the book of Daniel, where we see little comments like this. I'm just going to highlight verse 9 one more time here for you. Now, God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. How about that? Just like with the story of Joseph in the, in the book of Genesis, right? We're going to see that behind the scenes of a bad situation, God was still at work, providentially working out even these bad things for the good of those who love him, who, who've been called according to his purpose. God caused that official to show favor and have sympathy for Daniel and his friends. God allowed this hardship to happen in Daniel's life, but God was still there for him. Hope hadn't left the building. God was still protecting his people and helping them to do what he needed them to do. And the same thing is true for you and for me right now, friends. He is near to you, behind the scenes of your life, even when things seem far from normal to help you so that you can bloom right where he has planted you. We're going to continue to see all throughout this series in Daniel that when you live your life for God, he will never forsake you. When you live your life for God, trusting him, he will never let go of you, even, even when it seems for a moment like he has. We pick up the story one more time in verse 17. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the, the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. It was going to be a long time that Daniel and his friends were going to have to live this life that was anything but normal. Hopefully our time in this strange season of COVID-19 won't be anything near as long as that. At the same time, though, we see more and more reminders all around us that we, we really do live as exiles and strangers here in this world. Heaven, that's our real home. 
And until God brings us there, we're, we're going to continue to find ourselves in, in situations that don't feel normal, don't feel very comfortable. Things we might say, I didn't sign up for that. Things that might be really, really hard. But through which... God promises to be with you and even to use you to be a blessing to others as he helps you to bloom where he's planted you. The, the beginning of the book of Daniel, it starts out and, and everything, it sounds like a disaster. There's this godless king, he's, he's taken it, there's, there's death, there's destruction, there's captivity, there's, there's indoctrination into a false religion. It's bad. But in the end, and through it all, what we're going to find is more people than ever starting to give glory to God. Until finally, as Daniel says, one day, one day we'll see the King of Kings coming on the clouds of heaven, bringing victory for his faithful people. I want to end today by sharing kind of a, an aha moment that I had this week during a Zoom meeting. I was meeting up online with the other pastors from our Divine Savior Church uh, Association, and we were talking about uh, this new series, and we were talking about uh, Daniel chapter 1. And Pastor Joel from our Delray Beach campus had an insight that, that I had never thought of really before in this connection. And it gave me such great encouragement that, that I want to share it with you especially those of you who are trying to raise a, a Christian family in this world that we live in, and those of you who are, who are educators, trying to, to teach young people and equip them with the tools of Christian discernment and, and a biblical worldview and faith in Jesus Christ, when maybe sometimes, sometimes you wonder, is this going to stick? Are we making an impact? The question that was asked was this. How, how could Daniel and his friends, young men, probably teenagers, like in high school age, like how could they have this strong faith in Babylon after all that had happened, especially knowing that in the first two verses we read about this king Jehoiakim, who we find out in the Bible was a really godless, weak man who, who had no faith in the Lord whatsoever. Like, like, how could these young people be so strong in their convictions to live like this despite, despite a godless king like Jehoiakim? Hmm. And that's what Pastor Joel said. Well, you know, if you, if you look at the dates of the reigns of the kings and you think about kind of how old Daniel and his friends probably were, you know, it makes sense that, that Daniel and his friends probably grew up at a young age under the influence in the, in the royal palace of King Josiah. And I was like, whoa. That was really interesting. You know, maybe that name, Josiah, doesn't ring a, ring a bell for you, but I hope maybe after this it does. And here's why. Because Josiah was the one king in the middle of a whole bunch of bad ones who, who rediscovered for the people the Bible. Like, he literally found it, like, hidden away one day. And he's like, whoa, look what is in here. Wow, this is amazing. I want to share this with everybody. He started a reformation across the entire land where he made it his life's goal to, to teach and to preach and to share the message of, of God found in his word. To educate with God's word and to restore the worship life of the people, that was his life's highest priority. Just think if that also became ours. What, what happened? Well, Daniel and his friends, I think you can think about it like this, were going to school for a few years, perhaps in their elementary days, at the first Divine Savior Academy in Jerusalem, founded by godly King Josiah. And because of his influence and the time that they spent in the scriptures, their, their influence later on it impacted not just their lives and their family, impacted Babylon and Persia 
And wise men coming to find Jesus impacted the, positively the entire trajectory of the history of the world, bringing to fruition God's promise of a Savior for all people. So that on one dark Friday, many hundreds of, of, of years after Daniel and his friends even lived, when all, again, once seemed lost, Yet God will keep his promise of raising Jesus from the dead. Who walked out of that tomb on that first Easter, alive, promising that whoever trusts in him will have a place in an eternal kingdom. And an inheritance that no one can ever take away. No matter how far we might feel for a time from home. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, the Most High, thank you for the reminder that behind the scenes of history, you are still at work. And even through us, drawing people to your promises, those fulfilled in Jesus Christ and those yet to be fulfilled when he comes back. What a glorious future kingdom we look forward to. Right now, Lord, though, it's, it's super hard. Things feel far from normal. And we're struggling with how to deal with that. So we humbly ask you to, to help us bloom right where you've planted us so that you might use us to positively impact and influence others. Take our worries and replace them with a confidence in the big picture of your providence and help us see that when we make your word our treasure, there is no virus, no tyrant, no disaster that can ever take that away from us. And the comfort that because Jesus lives, the victory's won. In his name we pray. Amen.